lively group this morning. Rejoice for our God is able, amen? amen? If he is for us, who can be against us? Yesterday, Karen and I had the blessing of having a short visit with our granddaughter, and she's two and a half years old, and she said, Pop, I'm getting signed up for class. And I said, Willa, what class are you getting signed up for? And we were expecting gymnastics or, or ballet, and she said, Barati. I said, Barati? She said, you know, hi -ya. <laughs> And as we sang, Our God is Able, it reminded me of a quote by Bruce Lee. And Bruce Lee said, when the door locks behind you and you have 20 of your adversaries in the room with you, don't think, what am I going to do? I'm locked in here with them. Think, what are they going to do? They're locked in here with me. <laughs> Let's continue worship now as our offering, as our... Ushers come forward to receive our morning offering. Let's pray. Our Father and our God, we praise you and we thank you for the strength that we have in you. Father, our weaknesses are made strong in you. We thank you, Father, for the blessings that you have bestowed upon us. And we ask now as we give back a portion of that to you, you take these and use them in the furtherance of your ministry. We ask all these things in the name of Jesus Christ. Amen. Just a couple of quick announcements. Uh, the craft class for today has been canceled. It has been rescheduled for next week, February the 3rd. Uh, some of the things we have upcoming, a movie night on February the 9th. We have annual Sweethearts Banquet on February the 16th. And along with the Sweethearts Banquet, on February the 17th, we'll have a dinner for singles. So any singles who are interested in attending a dinner, that'll be February the 17th at the home of Mrs. Higgins. <laughs> we, also, <laughs> we also have the New Life for Mothers and Children's Banquet on March the 30th. At this time, we're going to have our ministry minutes, and we have Lee Friend, and Heidi coming to speak to us about a ministry at the school for lunches. Hey everyone. Good morning. Not long ago I was sleeping and I had a I was awakened with a message. And the message was uh, how to be part of a solution to a problem that I really had never even thought about. And uh, the message kept me awake all night long, kept running and running through my head, kind of like going through my own little groundhog day right there in my bedroom. <laughs> so, uh, so, I had, so it kept me awake all night long, so I knew where the message came from, and there wasn't a doubt in my mind. So the next day I knew there was two things I wanted to do. One, I wanted to be able to sleep that night. And two, I needed to contact Pastor Tom and let him know the message that I received. So I spoke with Pastor Tom, and uh, I said to him that I thought Heidi would be the perfect partner for this ministry. And, uh, ministry is um, a lot of people are facing financial challenges and hardships at one time in their life or another. And one of those that's going on that I never really realized that is pe uh, families' inability to pay for their children's school lunches while they're in school. And I think uh, the last thing that a child needs to worry about when they're sitting in school is whether they're going to go hungry that day or not. So uh, our ministry is this. This mailbox is going to be sitting in the lobby at St. Peter's. And <laughs> is it heavy? <laughs> and there's, a, there's a slide on top. If anyone would like to make donations, your donations would be greatly appreciated and more than welcome. And uh, Heidi and I would be responsible for these donations. And we're going to take these donations and uh, we're going to reach out on behalf of St. Peter's to the local schools in our community. And we're going to find... Uh, families, lunch bills that are in arrears or delinquent, and we're going to pay those bills off. I feel like this is a, just one more way that we can serve and give back to the community. So, helping one person might not change the world, but it might change the world for that one person. Thanks, Lee. Tom Dene, if you want to uh, come on up, please, and bring Tucker. 
We are in the midst of a baby boom here at St. Peter's. We are having lots of babies, and there's lots of babies in the womb, some uh, that have announced and some that haven't announced yet, so it's an exciting time in the growth of the church, and this little guy was prayed for for a long, long time, and what a blessing he is uh, to, to Tom and Danae, to their family, and to our church family. Hear the word of the Lord. Children are a gift from God. The fruit of the womb is a reward. Like arrows in the hand of a warrior, so are the children of one's youth. How blessed is the man whose quiver is full of them. And they were bringing children to Jesus so that he might touch them. And the disciples rebuked him, but when Jesus saw this, he was indignant. And he said to them, permit the little children to come to me, and do not hinder them, for such is the kingdom of God. Truly I say to you, whoever does not receive the kingdom of God like a child will not enter it at all. And he took them into his arms, and he began to bless them, and he laid hands on them. Hear, O Israel, the Lord our God, the Lord is one. You shall love the Lord your God with all your heart and with all your soul and with all your strength. These commandments that I give to you today are to be upon your hearts. Impress them on your children. Talk about them when you sit at home and when you walk along the road. Tie them as symbols on your hands and bind them on your foreheads and write them on the door frames of your houses and on your gates. And a key verse for this little young man is this, Joshua 1.9. Have I not commanded you, be strong and courageous, do not be terrified, do not be discouraged, for the Lord your God will be with you wherever you are. Throughout the ages, godly parents have brought their children to the Lord to dedicate them to him and to his service. Today, Tom and Danae follow in the biblical heritage of the godly men and women who have gone before them in the way of bringing Tucker to the Lord. And so dedication is a worthwhile act. It is a biblical act. Our Lord Jesus himself was dedicated by Mary and Joseph. And so if the Savior of the world needed to be dedicated at the temple, how much more even our children today need to be dedicated to God. And so Tom and Danae bring Tucker to be dedicated before the Lord to him, and to his service. And so I have a few questions for Tom and Danae. First, believing that Tucker is a gift from God and that the Lord will hold you accountable for him, do you solemnly now confess that it is your purpose to dedicate him to the Lord? If so, answer it is. It is. Will you pray for him and will you instruct him in the doctrines of our faith? Will you teach him to read the word of God and to pray for him and to take him faithfully to God's house of worship? If so, answer, I will. I will. Church family and the friends and other family who's gathered here today, we have a responsibility to Tucker as well. Raising children in this world is difficult, as we all well know. It takes a lot of effort. It takes godly parents, and it takes people surrounding these parents to help them. And so we have a challenge, church, to come alongside of this family and encourage and support them. Will you pray for this family? Will you encourage them to grow in their faith with Tucker? And will you do all that's in your power to help them, to help Tucker come to know Jesus as his Savior? If you will do that, please stand with me now. Well, let's pray. Tucker, we dedicate you to the Lord and to his service this day. We dedicate you in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. We pray that your life is nurtured and provided for by God's power in every area of your life. May you yield to the guiding influence of the Holy Spirit wherever he takes you. Tucker, we pray that God protects you mentally, physically, emotionally, and spiritually. God, we pray you put the armor on Tucker every day, the helmet of salvation, that he would be protected, the shield of faith, which would always extinguish the flaming darts of the enemy, the breastplate of righteousness, the belt of truth, feet shod with the readiness of the gospel of peace. 
God, may this child grow and be nurtured by Tom and Danae's careful influence. May our church come alongside of this family and help to lead him in walking with you. God, we pray that this young child always be found in fellowship with you. Your word promises that when we raise a child in the way of the Lord, when he's old, he will not depart from it. And we pray that for Tucker, that he would walk with you and for you his whole life long. In Jesus' great name we pray. And all St. Peter said, amen. Amen. Everybody can be seated. Tucker, what a blessing. Congratulations. Woo. All right, New Hope, if you'll come on back up and I ask everybody else to stand as we continue in our worship of our Lord. (laughs) Psalm 63 was a psalm of David when he was in the wilderness of Judah. O God, you are my God. Early will I seek you. My soul thirsts for you. My flesh longs for you in a dry and thirsty land where there is no water. So I have looked for you in the sanctuary to see your power and your glory. Because your loving kindness is better than life, my lips shall praise you. Thus I will bless you while I live. I will lift up my hands in your name. My soul shall be satisfied as with marrow and fatness, and my mouth shall praise you with joyful lips. You are my vision, O King of my heart. Nothing else satisfies all.
Amen. May we continue to just keep our God as our vision. is your name in all the earth we behold the breaking dawn the light that shines over everyone we look to you we long for you oh lord we behold the rising sun the earth awaits your hope has come, we look to you, we long for you, oh Lord, oh our Lord, oh our Lord, how majestic is your name in all the earth, oh falling rain like waters rise flood this place we reach to you we cling to you oh lord oh our lord oh our lord how majestic is your name in all the earth oh darkness oh your name is a word of truth oh your name oh your name oh your name is a light in the darkness oh your name is a word of truth oh your name oh your name oh your name is a light in the dark Proverbs 18.10 says, The name of the Lord is a strong tower, and the righteous runs into it and is safe. Let's just continue to worship our great and strong tower. As morning dawns and evening fades, you inspire.
nation singing louder as nothing has the power to save but your name oh Lord Jesus strong and mighty tower your name is a shelter like no other your name let the nation sing it louder there's nothing has the power to say but your name is a strong and mighty tower your name shelter like no other your name let the nation sing it louder cause nothing has the power to save but your name is a strong and mighty tower your name is a shelter like no Sing it louder Cause nothing has the power to save But your name Your name Oh Lord Give me strength for another day Give me strength day. for another day, Lord You give me strength Yes, God, your name is a strong and mighty tower. There are times in our week when taking the next breath, taking the next step, going to the next assignment at work, handling the next problem at home seems overwhelming to us. There's all kinds of challenges that we face in this world. We face medical troubles. We face financial troubles. We face relational issues. There's children and family and husbands and wives and all kinds of challenges. God, thank you that your name is a strong and mighty tower. That when we face all of these things, that we can run to it and we can find shelter and protection and safety and hope and help in your arms. God, there are so many, so many that we know that are really struggling right now. God, we pray they, they would run to you, that you would wrap your loving arms around them and comfort them and care for them. God, there's some that are battling deep, deep, deep sins in their lives that just have a hold over them. So God, we pray that in repentance they would come to you find forgiveness, find healing from those sins, find a new purpose and a way forward. God, all of us have sinned, and we've sinned this week, some of us by things we've thought, some of us by places we've gone, some of us by people that we've been with. So, Father, we just take a moment now to confess those sins to you. thank you that you are always safe that we can always run to your arms for all that we need in Jesus name we pray and all God's people said amen you may be seated all of our children can go with Miss Joanne right now to our children of God and I'll ask our Dominican Republic team who's leaving on a missions trip this week to come forward now come forward team as we have our time of commissioning
It's just part of the team, not the whole team. There's part of the team that couldn't be here this morning because they are, oddly enough, working in the medical field this morning. <laughs> so they're at work working in the medical field before they go to the Dominican this week, and we'll be doing a medical mission there. So we've asked them to come this morning, number one, so that you could see their smiling faces and be praying for them this week as they leave and they head down to the uh, Dominican where they'll be in Barona for a week. So our church is blessed uh, to have a ministry and a mission to the people in a third world country in the Dominican Republic. We are grateful that this team has heard God's word to take the gospel to people that desperately need it. Now, our church not only wants to recognize these individuals, but we want to set them apart for the service for the Lord. Commissioning is a biblical concept. We read these words in Acts chapter 13. While they were ministering to the Lord and fasting, the Holy Spirit said to them, set apart for me Barnabas and Saul for the work to which I have called them. And then when they had fasted and prayed, they laid hands on them and they sent them away. This medical missions team will serve as Christ's ambassadors and representatives of our church to the people of Bate 9 outside of Barona. Today, as a body of believers and with a heart for a lost world, we send you with gratitude for your part in fulfilling the great commission of Jesus Christ, we pray for you. As the Father sent Jesus, so Jesus sends you and so we send you. As the New Testament church sent their trained members into every corner of the known world, so we send you to the Dominican Republic. And as we send you, we pray you have compassion on the people just as Jesus did. We pray for those who have no hope and who are without God, that they would see in you the aroma of Christ to them. We pray for those who are darkened in their understanding and who have not yet come to a faith and belief in Jesus Christ. To those who are perishing, we pray you speak life. To those who are lost, we pray that you can bring them home. With the poor in spirit, may you share your gifts of healing and God's riches, mercy of Christ over them. To the sick of heart and to the sick in body, we pray you be a vessel of the great physician. We pray that you bind up the broken, that you lift up the fallen, that you share the good news to the poor and proclaim the year of the Lord's favor to them. So whether it's a cup of cold water, whether it's some medicine, whether it's a healing hand, whether it's a friendly chat, whether it's a warm smile, we send you in the name of our Savior. Go with our blessing and with the anointing of the Holy Spirit over you. Church, will just ask you to lift out your hands toward this team as we symbolically pray for them today. Let's pray. God, your word has said we are to go and make disciples of all nations. That includes right here in our community. That includes our county, our state, our country, and all around the world. Father, this church has a passion to reach those who are hurting. And Lord, we know that oftentimes before we can share the good news of Jesus Christ with them, we need to bring something to them, a provision in their life. Sometimes it's meeting a financial need. Sometimes it's food. And in this case, it's medical needs. There will be literally hundreds of people coming to the clinic that will be seeking healing. God, you've blessed these individuals with talents and gifts and learning and the rest of the team that have special training in the areas of medicine. And so, God, we pray you use their hands and their voices God, when they see things that they've not seen before, make clarity in their, in their wisdom and their mind how to treat these patients to bring healing to them. God, we recognize that all healing, as your word tells us in Psalm 103, all healing ultimately comes through you. And so, Lord, we pray you use these willing instruments of yours to bring encouragement and hope and health to hurting people. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. God bless you, team. Know we'll be praying for you every day. Send us those pictures of the beautiful Dominican sunrises every morning. Thank you. May God go with you and bless you.
All right, let's everybody take out your Bibles now. We'll continue in our church-wide study of 1 Corinthians. Uh, we're calling this study Stop the Madness as we'll be working through in all of calendar year 2018, the book of 1 Corinthians. We live in a culture where trust is hard to come by and distrust is more the order of the day. Who can you trust in our culture today? I saw a nationwide survey this week about the most trusted professions. 82% of Americans have responded saying the most trusted profession is nursing. We have a number of nurses here this morning. The most trusted profession in the country is nurses. Hats off to all of you. Coming in at second at 71% is our military officers and leaders, our generals and majors and captains. Teachers rated third at 66%, medical doctors 65%, a little further down the list, pastors at 42%, pretty sad. Not even half of America trusts our pastors. Bankers, 25%, car salesmen, 10%, members of Congress, I was surprised it was even this high, 11%. Lobbyists, 8%. Many people look to professionals to find their level of trust. Others put their trust in their bank accounts or their retirement portfolios. The Chinese right now, and this is sad, but very true story, and I've talked to some missionaries who are there. There's an active campaign across China where the, the Communist Party is in a propaganda release where they say, don't trust Jesus Trust President Xi to provide all that you need. True story, honest, that's going on right now in China. Still others only trust in themselves, and they build their wisdom on what their minds can conceive. Where's your trust? Who do you trust? And perhaps most importantly, how do you know? How do you discern when you can trust someone or something? People of the Apostle Paul's day had ongoing arguments about who they could trust. And he deals with part of that in our passage today. 1 Corinthians chapter 1, beginning in verse 18. For the word of the cross is foolishness to those who are perishing, but to us who are being saved, it is the power of God. For it is written, I will destroy the wisdom of the wise and the cleverness of the clever I will set aside. Where's the wise man? Where's the scribe? Where's the debater of this age? Has not God made foolish the wisdom of the world? For since in the wisdom of God, the world through its wisdom did not come to know God, God was well pleased through the foolishness of the message preached to save those who believe. For indeed, Jews ask for signs and Greeks Search for wisdom, but we preach Christ crucified to Jews a stumbling block and to Gentiles foolishness, but to those who are called both Jews and Greeks, Christ the power of God and the wisdom of God. Because the foolishness of God is wiser than men and the weakness of God is stronger than men. For consider your calling, brethren, that there were not many wise according to the flesh, not many mighty, not many noble. But God has chosen the foolish things of the world to shame the wise, and God has chosen the weak things of the world to shame the things which are strong, and the base things of the world and the despised God has chosen, the things that are not so that he may nullify the things that are, so that no man may boast before God. But by his doing, you are in Christ Jesus, who became to us wisdom from God, and righteousness, and sanctification, and redemption, so that just as it is written, let him who boasts, boast in the Lord. Paul reveals here that the wisdom of God seems foolishness to men. In thinking through this, many people have come to the conclusion that God cannot be trusted. In fact, many in our world today would doubt that God even exists. They reason that what is contained in the Bible is just foolish. 
Paul deals with this here in verse 18, saying, The word of the cross is foolishness to those who are perishing, but to us who are being saved, it's the power of God. For it's written, I will destroy the wisdom of the wise and the cleverness of the clever I will set aside. The wisdom of God seems foolish to mankind. And Paul uses the illustration here of the cross. Now, for us, talking about the cross and its seeming foolishness may not make sense because in our time, we have made the cross sort of a beautiful thing. Many of you ladies probably have a golden or silver cross around your neck. We decorate our homes with it. We put crosses around that are pretty, quote unquote. In Jesus' day, The cross was a symbol of shame and scorn and torture and execution. The cross was reserved for criminals, for slaves, for non-citizens, for those convicted of treason. After a criminal was convicted, it was the custom for the victim to be scourged, to be whipped. And many who were sentenced to crucifixion never even made it to the cross because the whipping and the scourging was so brutal and so bloodletting that they died before they even got to the cross. For those who survived the scourging, they were forced to carry the cross beam on their shoulders to outside of the city. They would not crucify their victims inside the city, so they would carry their cross beam outside of the city. There, to add to the humiliation, the shame, the victim would be stripped totally naked or his or her arms would be fastened to wood, some with nails, others with ropes. Then they were hoisted up and their feet were fastened to the bottom part of the upright cross, which was already buried into the ground, their feet being pierced with a single nail through both feet. One might agonize on the cross for several days before dying, apparently of suffocation. That's how they'd ultimately die when they got too weak to pull themselves up to take breaths. Pain was intense, thirst was immense, and victims were tormented with high fever and convulsions, which whacked their entire body. It was a bloody, ugly mess. The Romans had perfected making the torture inflict the maximum pain as a deterrent to crime and as a deterrent to rebelling against Rome. So for the Romans in Jesus' day, for Paul, for the Corinthians, to be crucified was an act of horror and shame. And so when God says that he was going to send his son to be crucified, and by the way, this was predicted a thousand years before Jesus came. If you don't believe me, read Psalm 22. Crucifixion had not even been invented yet as a method of capital punishment when David wrote Psalm 22. And as you read that psalm, And lay it aside of Isaiah chapter 53, which Isaiah wrote about 300 years after David. You see how God had set up in eternity past that his son would one day go to the cross. And so God, through the cross, shows the folly of trusting in human wisdom and that God's ways are not man's ways. There had to be atonement for the sin of mankind. And God ordained that it would come through one of the most shameful, horrific, gruesome ways that man invented to kill another person. The wisdom of God, Paul tells us here, puts the wise to shame. He writes, where's the wise man? Where's the scribe? Where's the debater of this age? Has not God made foolish the wisdom of the world? For since in the wisdom of God, the world through its wisdom did not come to know God, God was well pleased through the foolishness of the message preached to save those who believe. God's standard is different from our standards. God's design for us is one based on love. Sure, it makes no sense that we as sinful creatures would be paid for by a sinless man 
dying in a shameful way. God doesn't work the way man works. He sets aside the wisdom of the world, even the wisest among the wise men. The wisdom of the world comes from men and women, and it's very different from God's wisdom. One of the most famous atheists in the world is now the late Stephen Hawking. His own thought on God is this, quote, when you look at the vast size of the universe and how accidental and insignificant human life is, God seems implausible, end quote. Less known in our popular culture today, probably because he's younger, is atheist Richard Carrier, who's now 50. He says this, quote, it's very probable that Jesus never existed as a person, end quote. Or consider the words of another atheist, Lawrence Krauss, who says, forget Jesus, the stars died so you could be born, end quote. These men and many others like them have advanced degrees. They sit in professors in prestigious universities all around the world. Their intellects are sharp and their minds are strong. Their criticism of our faith comes from the wisdom of the world. What we as Christians believe on the surface sounds ridiculous and cra crazy, bordering on absurd to them. Indeed, faith in Jesus Christ doesn't make sense on the surface. It would make sense, wouldn't it, if you would have to run a thousand miles to earn your way into heaven, or adopt three children and raise them to be successful, or put some sum of money in an offering plate. Those things would make sense, wouldn't it? But that's not the way God chose to ordain that men and women, youth and children, would have eternal life. Instead, God is well pleased to make the message of his son known around the world. Paul says these are saved because they believe, saved from eternity away from God in hell to endure conscious punishment and endure the sins of their own. The wisdom of God demonstrates the power of God. Paul wrote in verse 22, Jews ask for signs and Greeks search for wisdom, but we preach Christ crucified to Jews a stumbling block and to the Gentiles foolishness. Indeed, while Jesus lived on many occasions, people came to him and said, Jesus, if you're the Messiah, give us a sign. Matthew records it in chapter 12 this way. Some of the Pharisees, the teachers of the law, came to Jesus and they said, Teacher, we want to see a miraculous sign from you. A little bit further, Matthew chapter 16, the Pharisees and the Sadducees came to Jesus to test him and they said, Give us a sign from heaven. The disciples, the inner circle, the 12 that followed Jesus closely, right after his triumphal entry into Jerusalem, as they sat on the Mount of Olives, they said to Jesus privately, tell us, when are all these things going to happen? What is going to be the sign that you're going to come again and be a sign of the end of the age? The apostle John records it this way of Jesus rebuking the great crowds, which he said, unless you people see miraculous signs and wonders, you will never believe. And unfortunately today, many people want to see miraculous signs from God as an indication of his reality. And there are times when we see those miraculous things, they in fact do occur. We see people healed when human doctors and nurses could not bring the healing. And God puts a hand upon them and touches them and heals them. Other times, we see God using doctors and nurses with their wisdom and ability to bring people back from what seemed hopeless on the surface. I have watched just this week in the hospital, doctors using their ability to restore hope and health and life to people who came in the ambulance, who it didn't look initially like the outcome was going to be so good. 
God does give us signs at times, and, and we're missing them. He has given us the greatest sign, and it's right behind me in the center of our worship. It is the symbol of the cross, the symbol of shame and scorn, yes. But it is so much more than that. It is a symbol of hope and healing and guidance and eternity in heaven with God because he loved us and gave his son for us. Verse 24, to those who are called, Jews and Greeks, Christ, the power of God, the wisdom of God, because the foolishness of God is wiser than men, and the weakness of God is stronger than men. God demonstrates his power, not not only by signs, not only by human wisdom, but through the selfless act of love of Jesus Christ on the cross. And today he calls all of you, including myself, to him to receive forgiveness at the cross through faith in him. The truth is, without God calling any of us, we would never be saved, Paul tells us. God calls, we respond to his call through faith and belief in our hearts that Jesus is who he said he is, that he died on that Roman cross, that he conquered Satan's sin and the death and the grave, that he rose again on the third day, that he ascended into heaven, and one day he is going to return from the right hand of God to restore his kingdom to this world. Until then, church, it is our job to make much of the cross, to make the wisdom of God known, which is that his son would die in a way that doesn't make sense so that we might have lived, so that we might live. God's wisdom is not depending upon us. Paul says in verse 26, Consider your calling, brethren. There were not many wise according to the flesh, not many mighty, not many were noble, but God has chosen the foolish things of the world to shame the wise. God has chosen the weak things of the world to shame the things that are strong, and the base things of the world and the despised God has chosen, the things that are not so that he may nullify the things that are so that no one can boast before God. And so Paul tells us here that the wisdom of God and our salvation is not depending upon our ability. It doesn't matter how good you are at what you do. It doesn't matter what family you were born into, whether you're rich or you're poor, whether you're American or Dominican or any other culture in the world. It doesn't matter what we do. None of that matters, Paul says, so that none of us can boast before God. We could have reason for pride and arrogance if we did great accomplishments for the Lord. We could say, see, God, see how good I am? You have to let me into heaven because of all the wonderful things I've done for you. It would be a foolish statement because none of us can do anything without God. Instead, the weak before God are strong. We come humbly to the creator of the universe Because there's zero, zip, zilch, nothing that we can do to earn God's favor. All we can do is humbly bow before him and say, my Lord and my God. The wisdom of God, therefore, brings humility. As we stand before the almighty God and know there's nothing that we can do, Paul says, by his doing, you're in Christ Jesus, who became to us a wisdom from God and a righteousness and sanctification and redemption, so that just as it is written, let him who boasts, boast in the Lord. So yes, the wisdom of God causes us to be humble, where we sinners are made right before God. And he tells us here in this text that we are righteous, Not in our actions, not because of who we are, not by how many times we come and sit in a pew, not by how many songs we raise our hand to God in worship. None of that makes us righteous. What makes us righteous is believing in Jesus Christ. It's an imputed righteousness that God puts upon us. And so he takes our filthiness and our sin off of us and he puts it on his son and in exchange he takes the righteousness of Christ and puts it over us. 
Therefore, we're made holy by the blood of Christ. We're sanctified because the blood of Jesus cleanses us from all sin, and we're redeemed from that sin by his very blood. So we're taken from bondage and sin, and we're given to God in eternal life through him. has huge implications for us, church. The main emphasis of this church is making much of the cross. So today, church, God calls us to get rid of any sin that's in our lives, whatever it is. We call to him and ask for forgiveness. And as you do that, praise God for his gracious forgiveness. Thank God that he did send his son to go to the cross to have his blood shed for you. I've asked Chris and Teela to come and lead us in a song just as a way to to wrap up this message today. It's a song that we sing here quite a bit, How Deep the Father's Love for Us. The words to this song emphasize the message of the centrality of the cross the humility that we have because of who Jesus is and what he's done. We just ask everybody to remain seated. If you want to sing along with Tila, you're welcome to. If you just want to sit in quietness and just bow your head and listen to the, the words wash over your soul, let God's graciousness be revealed to you of how much he loved you in sending his son to the cross. Chris?
Jesus, thank you that you were willing to go to the cross for us, to have your blood shed, to have your body pierced, to pay for the sin of all who will believe in you. God, we, we thank you and praise you for that. Thank you that our sins are washed clean. Thank you that your wisdom is foolishness to the world. And none of us can earn our way into your kingdom. We, we can't go on enough missions trips. We can't put enough money in the offering plates. We can't adopt, adopt enough kids in our home. All those are wonderful things to do, but none of it makes us right in your sight. And so, God, thank you that you showed the ultimate manifestation of your love in your son, dying on the cross, a symbol of scorn and shame and rebuke to make the way for us. God, I pray that any who are here today who have not taken that faith step of believing in Jesus Christ as Savior would do so today. Would come forward as we sing our closing song in just a few moments to receive from you the gift and promise of everlasting life. And now, God, we pray you hear our prayers of intercession as uh, Elder Joe comes to lift them before you now. Lord, we pray that you would bring a buyer for the crone's home, Lord. Pray that they would be able to, to, to move to the farm and, and only have one place to take care of, Lord. Pray that you would be with those that are in marriages that are struggling, Lord. Pray that they would, they would individually seek you, Lord. And as they grow closer to you, they would grow closer to each other, Lord. We know that marriage is sacred. Pray that you would just intervene in these situations and that they would be willing to, just to seek the help that they need. We pray that you would bring healing to Larry Keller for the, the cancer, Lord. We pray that you would just bring courage and strength and wisdom. Lord, we pray that you would be with the DR medical team just for safety in their travels, Lord, that you would provide the appropriate weather for the, the trip. Just keep the team healthy so they can stay focused on, on ministry, Lord, and and not on their own um, physical conditions. We pray that you would just touch the, the hearts of, of all that they meet, Lord. Pray that you would just truly make them your hands and your feet, Lord. Just be with all of us this week as we, as we go about our, our weekly tasks, Lord. Give us the strength to, to stand up for our faith, Lord. Help us to remember that it's not us, but it's you in us, Lord, that gives us the, the strength to, to uh, do everyday tasks, Lord, but also to live out our faith. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Everybody can stand and sing with us our last song our, to our great and strong God.
you for being our strong God, that you are our strong tower. Lord, we thank you that you go before us and that nothing can stand against us because we have you with us, Father. Father, we thank you for the power that we have in Jesus Christ. Lord, we thank you for sending your son Jesus to die on that cross for our sins. Lord, we just thank you for that forgiveness of sins and the hope that we have and for eternal life to come. Lord, we just praise you and we thank you for being our great and awesome and mighty God. We love you, Lord, and we thank you. And it's in Jesus' mighty name that we pray. Amen. Thank you all for coming and have an awesome week.